effective fellowship. If we're going to talk about church membership, we need to understand fellowship. And there are any number of ways you might choose to talk about the mission of the church. There are different ways we can talk about the mission and the purpose of the church. Troy, if you could put me one slide forward. Perfect, there we go. We're going to read Philemon chapter, well, chapter 1. The only chapter in Philemon. We're going to read Philemon 4 to 7. And I'm going to read it to you in my NIV Bible here. And then I'm going to immediately read it for you in another translation. An updated version of the NIV, actually. So my NIV is coming out of the 80s. The one that I have in my hand. It was given to me long ago. I've cherished it for years. But I want to, I want to just... We're going to highlight something that's different in the, the updated versions of the NIV. So let me read it for you, then we'll come back to that change. This is, by the way, the word of the Lord. We're going to thank God for his word. Listen well. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. God's word, we thank him for it. Now, I have a little note in my Bible. Verse 6, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. I don't think that's actually the best way to render this Greek idea. And in fact, as I did my translation work on my Greek this week, this whole section we've got here is a bit of a mess when it comes to our English-speaking ears. It's very difficult to translate for English ears. And to show you some of the challenge of that, so I just read from the NIV. That was the NIV I read. Let me read for you to, from the updated NIV. And this is how they put it. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. I'll read the two side by side again, and then I'm going to explain why one is the way it is and why the other is the way it is. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. It's the old NIV. The new NIV says, I pray that your partnership with us in faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. It's a really difficult sentence to translate from the Greek idea to the, new, uh, to, to the English idea because the word at, that we were sort of focusing on is a word that appears many times in the New Testament and it's right at the core of what it means to be the church. The word in Greek is koinonia. Fellowship. That might be a word you've heard before in a church. Koinonia. Fellowship. But it means a sharing. It means what we have in common. And so in the old version of the NIV, the old New International Version, they looked at that idea of fellowship and sharing, and they thought that what Paul was referring to was the sharing of our faith. So what does sharing your faith sound like? Like you're sharing your faith, right? You go and you share with someone else. I believe in Jesus. Here's why I think you should believe in Jesus. And, you, and, we, and we do evangelism is the word we use, right? That's a sharing of our faith. But I think a better translation is the one we found in the updated NIV. Our partnership in faith. The ESV puts it this way, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ Jesus. You can hear sort of both sides of it coming through in the ESV. Let me tell you why I think it's important we understand that what Paul is talking about in Philemon here is actually fellowship that we have together with one another. Because if you don't understand fellowship, you will have an anemic view of the church. And what Paul is asking Philemon to do here is to understand that our brotherhood, our, our family relationship as a church of Jesus Christ changes the way we relate to one another. And that's what church is all about. Church is all about recognizing that we are one in Jesus, together, a family. And if you don't understand fellowship, you will have an anemic view of the church. So what is anemia? Does anybody know what anemia is? Anemia is a condition that has to do with the red blood cells. And we're talking medically. 
It's a condition that has to do with your red blood cells. There's a dysfunction in your blood. It can leave you tired. It can leave you without energy. But if we call something anemic, and we're not talking about the medical definition. Anemia is a lack of vitality. Anemia is a lack of force or spirit or interest or savor or substance or quality. If you do not understand Christian fellowship, you will have an anemic view of the church. One of the key ideas at the core of what it means to be a church is fellowship, koinonia. And in the 21st century, one of the greatest threats to the thriving of the church in North America, one of our most significant shortcomings is an anemic understanding of fellowship. Our understanding of fellowship has no vitality. It has no force. It has no spirit. There's very little interest. It has no savor. It has no substance. It has very little quality. Because we hear the word fellowship and we think, oh, we're having coffee together. And you know, we saw it this morning. And there's, let me illustrate the danger by what we talked about this morning. We are going to have Sandwich Sunday. Praise God. That's a great thing. But it's possible for us to sit down and gather around the tables and sit across from the people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ and sit down at those tables and talk about nothing more deep than the weather outside the windows. If that's what we do on Sandwich Sunday, we have not experienced genuine Christian fellowship. So let's look at what Paul is saying in Philemon here. He says, I always thank God, my God, for you as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Paul is writing to Philemon with a particular purpose. This was a letter that came in a package to the church in Colossae. There was one church for, sorry, there was one letter for the church as a whole, but there was also a particular letter that was going to Philemon personally from Paul. And Paul writes this letter to Philemon because there is a personal issue that Paul wants to address. It has to do with his former slave, Onesimus. Onesimus escaped from Philemon. He ran away. He was a slave in the house. And he ran away from Philemon. It's likely that he probably stole something, a few things, some, some valuables or some money. It's likely he did some, uh, he, 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 he committed theft in, as part of his escape. And Philemon found his way to Rome where Paul was. And as Philemon comes in counter with Paul, somewhere between his theft and his departure and his meeting Paul, Philemon comes to believe in Jesus Christ. And so Paul meets Philemon not only as an escaped slave, but now as a brother in the Lord. And he says, Philemon, because you belong to Jesus... And because your former master belongs to Jesus, you need to go and do what is right. You need to return to the house of your former master. You need to restore that relationship because you're no longer just master and slave. You are now brothers in Jesus Christ. Do you hear how, because Philemon has become part of the church, the fellowship has changed their relationship? You and I don't relate to each other anymore the same way we did when we were strangers even when we were neighbors, because we belong to Jesus, we are brothers and sisters in him. To the point where it's impossible to talk about the individual members of a church body apart from the body itself. You can't take the ear and throw it away and say, you just be an ear, we're going to be the rest of the body. You can't do that. You can't cut off the foot and say, you'll be fine, you just live as a foot for the rest, and we'll, the rest of the body will get along with it. You can't do that. When you become part of the body of Christ, you are one with the body in Christ. And so Paul is sending this letter to Philemon, and he's reminding Philemon that his love is for all the saints. Isn't that interesting? Your love for all the saints. Who does that now include? Onesimus, right? The slave who ran away. Your love for all the saints. And so what Paul then says is remarkable. I pray. So remember, we, he talked about Philemon. I remember you in my prayers. I give thanks for you. Now he says, this is what I pray for you when I pray for you, Philemon. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Or, as we remembered, sorry, I'm going to stop reading from there because I want to. 
I pray for you that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share in Christ. Fellowship in the faith, the fellowship of the faith, brings us to know what is ours in Christ Jesus. Which means if you sacrifice fellowship, you lose something of your inheritance in Christ. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective, our fellowship is effective in bringing us to a deeper understanding of everything we share, every good thing we share in Jesus Christ. Do you understand now why, if we don't understand fellowship, we will never get church right? I want to point out one more thing here before we move on to talk about, okay, so what, is, what, do, we, what do we need to know about the church then? I want to point out the fact that our fellowship is in Christ. So, for your, the sake of your sermon notes, let me make this crystal clear. Our practical definition of fellowship is far too weak. We are family in Christ. We are one in Him. And that one in Him can never be forgotten. Because if you treat the church like any other service agency or organization, you'll begin thinking, well, we can adapt and adopt different rules and procedures and policies based on what works best right now. And the church does not have that freedom. Because we have a head, we have a king who stands over us, and we are one in him. And that is great news for us. That is phenomenal news for us. And we see both sides of it demonstrated in Philemon and in Onesimus. Let me first start off with Philemon. Because we have a king who is over us. Philemon doesn't get to dictate what being part of the family of God means. Philemon doesn't go to Onesimus and say... Yes, I know that forgiveness is part of the Christian church. I know that's part of what I bought into when I, when I embraced Christ. But you have gone too far. Paul, or Philemon doesn't get to say that, does he? We talked about it yesterday. We talked about it at the men's breakfast. Forgiveness is a key element of what it means to belong to Jesus. Forgiveness. Do you remember what Jesus said on the cross as they crucified him, as they mocked him, as they put him to death, an innocent dying for the guilty? Remember what he said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You will never suffer anything as outrageous as what Christ suffered, and in his suffering, he prayed forgiveness over the perpetrators. Now, there may be people in your life that you can't allow in for, for, for because you know they're not to be trusted, you know that they're going to wound. There, there may be people who, who you, it's not safe to allow them intimacy with you in a relationship. But that's not the. But even in that, we need to remember, forgiveness sets us free to not hold those things over us. I once heard it expressed like this. You probably heard the expression, holding a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for your enemies to die where forgiveness sets us free. And so for Philemon, because he belongs to Jesus and Jesus is the king and we are one in him, Philemon is obligated to follow his king. And the great news is the king always takes us to the best places. What does it say about the good shepherd in Psalm 23? He leads us to green pastures and still waters. Even if we have to go through the valley of the shadow of death, he leads us there and he anoints our head with oil and he sets a table before us and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as a church family, there are going to be times where people say, well, shouldn't we really embrace this idea? Or shouldn't we really open ourselves up to this concept? Or don't you know that the world is changing and moving forward? And we as a church have to say, yes, but King Jesus has said. And we don't follow the world. We don't embrace those things. So on the one side of this fullness in him, on one side of the fact that we have these good things in Christ is the fact that he is our king and he defines what it means to be a church. He defines what it means to live well. On the other side of that, and I want you to hear this very clearly, on the other side of that is this truth, that everyone Jesus has accepted should be accepted by us. Do you hear what I'm saying there? 
There is, if Jesus has said, I died for that one, they have given themselves to me. They are mine. We have no right to say, no, you can't belong. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in this book, right? He's sending Onesimus back to the church, to, to the church in Colossae. He's sending him back to Philemon, his former master. And he says, now he is a brother. He is coming home. And Paul says, you know, I could be heavy handed. I could be bold and I could order you to do what you ought to do. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. Jesus loves this one. They belong to him, so they belong to you as well. So I want you to hear that very clearly this morning. If you belong to Jesus, you have a place in our fellowship. There may be times where we need to have some tough conversations. I thank God for the people who have been able to graciously confront me and say, this is not okay. This needs to stop. And we recognize that there are occasions, Jesus in Matthew chapter 18 says, when someone wrongs you, you go to them, you pre pre present the wrong, and we pray that the, the breach is healed there. But if it's not healed there, then you bring an, along another one who can come and, and sort of, uh, we, can, we can work this out together. And if that doesn't work, then we bring it before the whole church. And if, if it's still not able to be dealt with at that point, yeah, you, you have to treat them as if maybe they weren't really believers in the first place. As a, as a tax collector, as one of these pagans. There are times where we have difficult days of fellowship or where we have to have difficult conversations. But the point, the heart, the, the, the thing that we see in the book of Philemon here is that if you belong to Jesus, you are part of the church. And no one in that church, because Christ is king, not them, no one in that church can turn to you and say, you're not good enough, you don't belong here. No one. Because you belong to King Jesus. That's why we need to understand fellowship if we're going to understand the mission of the church. That's why in the 21st century, one of the greatest threats to our thriving as a church, one of our most significant shortcomings is an anemic understanding of fellowship. We are one in Christ. Let me read for you what Paul said in Ephesians. Ephesians 11, I'm going to read a few verses here. Or Ephesians 4 verses 11 following. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. There is a unity that is there. So we understand that fellowship, a, a bold, full-bodied understanding of fellowship is key to our understanding what it means to be a church. So let me talk very quickly about the mission of Faith Baptist Church. And we could talk about it in different ways. Let me show you one way that's a little bit disconnected from this. I was asked to write a paper not long ago for, uh, for the seminary as part of my master's degree. Troy, can you go to the next slide? Say, what is the, what is, if you were to propose a, a mission for our church, and this is, by the way, not our official church mission. This is just Pastor TJ talking, Okay. So you won't find this in any of our official documents, but I think it's helpful, and I think you're going to see why I suggested if we had to come up with a new mission, why this something like this might be helpful. So, Faith Baptist Church exists to be a Christ-centered community where hearing becomes believing, believing becomes living, and living becomes witness. That could be a mission of our church, right? And I, hopefully you can see where I come with that. That's a gospel pattern. First off, that Jesus is at the center, so you got my, I, I love this I'm not a very artistic person, but every so often I do something, I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good for me. <laughs> so I did this diagram where Jesus is the center, and we see this gospel pattern, right? Jesus goes out and he preaches the good news, the arrival of the kingdom of God, and people hear it. And upon hearing it, they believe in it, they start to trust in it. So once they put their trust in Jesus, then they start living like Jesus. And as they go out and live like Jesus, they then become his witnesses in Ju Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth, right? There's this gospel pattern that we see in the Bible. And if we as a church could re replicate that, I think we'd be doing what God has sent us to do. So we could talk about mission something like that, okay? I give that as an example. But I want to, this morning, propose to you a much simpler definition, a simpler mo uh, um, mission of the church based on fellowship. So if you can go to the last slide there, Troy. 
I want to suggest to you that the mission of our church is to move people toward the center. In your sermon notes, it says something like this. As a church, we are to make it our mission to draw people to the gospel and then to draw believers into deeper fellowship by God's work through us. So we go out and we present the good news of Jesus to those who need to hear it. And so when you come into contact with us as a church, we want to share with you, we have one message here. This church has only one thing to share with the world. Jesus saves. That's all we have to share. And now it works itself in a million different ways. There's a million applications of that. But our number one message, the only message we have, is Jesus saves. And so our first priority is to draw people towards that gospel message by God's grace. We don't do it because we're clever. We don't do it because we're attractive. We don't do it because we're particularly smart or good. Or you know, Look at your pastor, right? This is what you're working with. God working through us uses some pretty blunt instruments to bring people to the gospel. And then once they have come to the gospel, our job as a church, our mission as a church, is to draw us into deeper fellowship. Do you hear, what, do you hear how that's coming directly from Philemon? We become closer and closer, more tightly knit, so that our fellowship in the gospel will be effective in deepening our understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I'm taking that directly from the scripture. As, we, as our fellowship becomes more and more effective, our oneness becomes more and more effective, we discover more and more of all the good we have in Christ. And so as a church family, we want to move people who attend who occasionally attend our church family. We want to say, hey, we want you to become closer in fellowship with us. And as we have people who attend our church family regularly and more regularly, we say, hey, we want you to become more deeply involved. We want to strengthen our fellowship. We want to strengthen that unity. We want to become brothers and sisters who are everything to one another because Christ is in us and we are one in him. I think our church could do much worse than to adopt a position where we see it as our mission to share the gospel with those who need to hear it and then bring believers deeper and deeper and deeper into fellowship by God's work through us. And brothers and sisters, as we do that, as you commit yourself to that, as you commit yourself to deepening fellowship, to getting rid of these weak, useless ideas of what it means to, to do fellowship, to have koinonia with one another, as we strengthen our concept and our understanding of what it means to be one in Christ, the words of Paul to Philemon will be true of us. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Let's pray.